Because not only did, like you said, did they look if there's any transference or counter transference or the relationship that's going on, but yeah. it's also, am I on the right track? Is this, you know, the, the path that I should be going down? Because if you're not in supervision, you could be going down the wrong path for quite a while before you realise this isn't actually working. It's not effective. Absolutely. And the, the sort of collegial discussion you have in supervision, whether it's group or individual, about different options and different paths that you may or may not be going down in terms of therapeutic goals are so vital. Otherwise, you're, you, you, you're limiting options for yourself. Yeah. And like you've just said, you might actually be going down the wrong path and therefore repeating history for the client. <laughs> We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with myself, Jackie Jones, and the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook. We're up to episode 65. Gosh, 65. I always seem to start. I was looking back at these podcasts saying, oh, number 63 or number 64 or number 65 or something like that. I remember the Beatles song, which goes like... Uh, oh, when I'm 65, will you still love me? 64. 64, was it? All right. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, I'm 71. So I don't know what age when that record come out. And now suddenly I'm way past 64. Oh, well, you don't look it. You don't look a day over 50, Bob. <laughs> anyway. Those the, kind words. I know. I have, I, have to, I have to stroke your ego, Bob. That's what I do. So um, on this episode, what we're going to be looking at is how supervision aids effective therapy. We've spoke about supervision before in other ones, but maybe not in this context. Yeah. The, con the context I wanted to talk about was how supervision aids effective therapy. In other yeah. words... If we don't have supervision, then therapy's not, be, well, several things. But number one, super, you know, therapy is not likely to be so effective because um, you've got no outside person looking in, if you like. You've got no yeah. one to help you, uh, help the therapist this is, to help the therapist look at, A, what they might not be doing, which is effective, and B, what they could be doing, which is more effective. Yeah. So... You know, I know it's part of our regulating body, the therapists have supervision. And there's lots of good reasons for that. But one of the number one reasons is without supervision, psychotherapy won't be as effective in my yeah. belief system. Yeah. I had group therapy and that was really helpful. Oh. Because you're listening to other therapists as well, talking about those. And you can always find something that's of use, even if it's not your time to talk or whatever. You're constantly learning. Yeah. A, do you mean group supervision or group therapy, Jackie? Group supervision. Yeah. After yeah. I qualified, I, I went to yeah. group supervision. Yeah. Yeah. I think group supervision um, is great. Yeah. And I teach a supervision certificate where I talk about the advantages it's disadvantages of group versus individual supervision and what you're talking about one is one of the big advantages of group supervision where you have um something called vicarious supervision yeah so you learn off the supervision if you like of one of the other people in the group yeah so there's a vicarious there's a vicarious aspect to supervision but as a therapist, you see, if you don't have supervision, you're in a very alone place. Yeah. And, um, you, the, you know, there's no support. There was no one to talk about your anxieties to. And yeah. more important, there's no one to spot any counter-transference issues that might be going on, which actually hinders the therapy process rather than leading to effective um, psychotherapy. Definitely, because for confidentiality reasons, you can't discuss anything with anybody about how you're feeling or the client or or anything. Supervision is a really safe space to be able to do that. Yeah, I mean, I've I only I run some therapy groups now, but mostly I've ended my sort of clinical career, and um, I've probably got forty years 
of dramas and <laughs> uh, issues in my head which will go nowhere else <laughs> because of confidentiality unless I sort of um, do some sort of book where you know like learning from the patient or I talk about vignettes of client material where it's actually names are changed and things like that in terms of a learning process but I suspect they'll you know stay in my head till I pop off yeah yeah and I, I, I just think supervision is good for you know whether it, you're talking about effective therapy or not but it's good to know that you are on the right tracks with clients particularly in the early days oh <clears throat> as a big in the beginning when you start seeing clients for the first time or even the first couple of years if you call that the first stage yeah, yeah then, then, then then that's vital because uh how are you going to know whether you're on the right track or not Which that's it yeah really important question yeah so, uh you you yourself when you started seeing clients can you imagine not having supervision no not at all because not only did like you said do they look if there's any transference or counter transference or the relationship that's going on but it's also, am I on the right track? Is this, you know, the the path that I should be going down? Because if you're not in supervision, you could be going down the wrong path for quite a while before you realise this isn't actually working. It's not effective. Absolutely. And the the sort of collegial discussion you have in supervision, whether it's group or individual, about different options and different paths that you may or may not be going down in terms of therapeutic goals are so vital otherwise you're you, you you're limiting options for yourself yeah. and like you've just said you might actually be going down the wrong past and therefore repeating history for the client yeah and ethics as well practicing ethically that was something i was always checking with my supervisor about whether it was ethical you know to, to see i don't know if, if I had one client and they recommended me to somebody else, would it be ethically ethical for me to see that person? You oh, know, if they were a family member or they worked together or something, it was good to have somebody to touch base with and just check. Oh, you know, 100% or you could have 110%, percent i would say that. Yes, absolutely. Especially at the beginning when you're a beginning therapist, but also as you go along. I remember, and I, I'll, I'll pick a couple of, Case, cases here to demonstrate the fact that uh, quite a um, I don't know how long I've been practicing as a therapist probably two years or so I was a locum therapist standing in for somebody and he came in and you know and said um, quite proudly that uh, he'd done well with this particular person therapy he'd been working with for seven years or something oh so he must have been practicing for seven years and then he went on to say uh and look what he get. Look what uh, he gave me, uh, and he got his um, mobile phone out. Mobile phone out. Show me a picture of a big painting, and uh, said to me, "Yes, he gave me this wonderful painting." And you know, it's by a well-known Italian artist. Oops. And I said, <laughs> "I said, gosh, he gave you that? Yes, yes, he did." And um, so I said, "Oh, right." And uh, what do you plan to do? Do you plan to accept this gift or, or what? Oh, I'm going to accept it. It's just a mark of what I've achieved in psychotherapy. So I said, oh, oh, right, interesting. So who is it by? And we looked at it. So I said, hang on a second. So I looked up and it was worth £20,000. <gasps> oh, MG. No idea of the ethics yeah. of what that means in terms of taking gifts and um you know social workers for example they will get um probably uh thrown out of their social work post if they accept any types of gifts even oh. um a 10 pound gift voucher um, i don't know if we go that far as a therapist but certainly we need to think about the ethics of taking gifts but certainly a valuable gift like that oh. it shifts the dynamic as well somehow doesn't it when there's gifts exchanged yeah, yeah. So the super, so I was a supervisor, and I I was a local supervisor, and we explored the ethics about all this lot, and um, he found a way to give back the gift uh, in a way which wasn't rejecting but uh, ethical. 
and ah. uh, San. So without the supervision from me, uh, he, he, he had never thought about the idea of what receiving gifts meant from a, a therapeutic standpoint. But it's understandable we, without somebody overseeing you. Oh. It's, it's a very nice gesture for that person. Yeah. He, he obviously thought the therapy was going well and wanted to give a gift. And it seems perfectly harmless mm -hmm. until you look at it for what it is and ethically. And I think there's a lot of ethical tripwires in therapy. Oh, there's a lot, another one, wasn't this? Is one for me personally, um, where I found out I started seeing a client who looked, the story seemed very familiar four sessions in. It turns out turned out to be the brother. Yeah. A brother I had, in other words. So it wasn't till I was in supervision when I talked about that, was that highlighted? And yeah. this was the beginning of my career. So there's many examples of where we can be going down the wrong path ethically. Yeah. But we need a supervisor or a mentor in that supervisory process that can overlook and um, help us on the right path yeah because you know even even the client doesn't understand a lot of the time you know when i've had referrals if i've seen a mum for example and then they say well my daughter wants to see somebody can you see them and it's like well no that that wouldn't be ethical mm. Mm. Mm, absolutely and and they they don't always take kindly to it either no they don't and you're quite right it's a good point that the clients often don't understand yeah. um, what we're talking about in that sense of terms of boundaries. Maybe they haven't, maybe some of their issues are around boundaries, for example, or issues might be about confidentiality or whatever we're talking about here. So um, there's an educative part to this. Um, the client may need um, you know, some understanding of the ethics as well, as well as the therapist, but the therapist, without supervision can easily go down into a minefield yeah. app, if you like. Yeah. You know. Um, and the supervisor is usually a wealth of experience as well. You know, you touched on, you know, educational therapy. That's what I enjoyed about supervision. Do you know what I mean? If it was something that I didn't fully understand, we would talk through it in supervision. Oh. You know, me and my diagrams, they would explain it with diagrams and, you know, even so much so that they'd get the book out and refer to it in, you know, the TA Today or something and, and we'd work through it together. And role play. We did a lot of role play in supervision. I really enjoyed supervision, by the yeah. way. I had it all my career. That's 40 years, 38 years. Uh, and it's taken different shapes as I've gone along. But certainly at the beginning, I used to lap up supervision from a sense of understanding and developing um, yeah. myself as a therapist yeah and, and I, would have, I think i would have got into quite a few scrapes if i hadn't had a supervisor to take my cases to i'm sure i would 100 percent. in fact I, I i i i'm sure that i narrowly missed a lot of those potholes and tripwires by being in supervision and just you know, talking it through before I made a decision and was told, yeah, that's that's not going to work. You you don't want to be doing that. But had I not had somebody to talk to, it seemed perfectly logical to me. That's right. And I think for the people listening, especially perhaps people who don't know the air of therapy much, I just want to say that supervision is confidential as well. Yeah. It, it isn't about you know, an confidential space. It's a confidential space where we can take our anxieties, our learnings and everything else that we've been talking about here uh, to ponder over and reflect over, if you like. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it, it, confidentiality is the name of the game throughout the whole process of supervision. Yeah. And I think for me, one of the helpful things, again, particularly in the early days, was when I just got <clears throat> stuck with a client Mm. it's like we hit a brick wall and I didn't feel like we were we were doing very effective work mm. so I could talk about what I had done and then give my ideas and then we'd work out between us right maybe this is what you need to be doing next yeah and then take it back to the client and reflect yeah. with the client about the options 
ahead or the journey ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, so transparency is uh, important there. Definitely. I'm building up your own confidence. Having supervision made me a lot more confident as a, a therapist. Oh. And I said, another thing which is important in supervision is often called the third dimension of supervision, which I think needs to be talked about, is the client's fantasy of the therapist supervisor. So, so for example, I was in I was therapy a long time, but I used to have fantasies about, oh, I wonder what her supervisor thinks about uh, me if she, if if she takes um, you know if she takes my case to uh, him and am I the most dreadfully uh, troubled person if uh, if my therapist has to take me to my and I always remember I had supervision at twelve sorry I had therapy oh no my therapist went to supervision at 12 o'clock and uh, I saw my therapist just after she came back from supervision um, I used to think oh, I wonder what they've been talking about and wow. I had lots of fantasies about the role the therapist supervisor has in my therapeutic developments yeah so it's interesting that isn't it well I even it is it's, it's really interesting and that was one thing I always said yeah. to my clients in the early days was that you know obviously everything is confidential the only person that I ever talk to is my supervisor and oh. you know obviously that is confidential but supervisors have supervisors yeah <laughs> and supervisors <laughs> and supervisors have supervisors and it's like a pyramid and I've always wondered who's at the very top of that where where do where does it end? end yeah because, very, you, you know, you supervise others, but you had a supervisor. Yeah, so you can think of the multiple fantasies, can't you? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Might, might have. Yeah. That, yeah. That was one of mine. I used to think of it as a pyramid and think, I just wonder who's who's at the very pinnacle of this pyramid. Yeah. Where well, there's, ne there's never really a, ever just two in the room. No, no. Not just the therapist and the client, because an ethical therapist will have a supervisor. Yeah. They may, at some time. Um, take some uncertainties, anxieties, or stuck places they have with their clients to the supervisor. And so we've got that whole process started off. And now, interesting what you just said, uh, uh, as a client you used to think about where does the, where does it end? And then maybe there's a sort of link to uh, grandfathers and the role grandfathers played in the history. Yeah. In terms of this process we're talking about here. Yeah. So we, without supervision, therapy wouldn't be effective. I think it would be a different animal. Yeah. And luck would play a large part, I think. Yes. So yeah. in other words, the therapist may produce effective therapy and I think may not. So luckily they might, yeah, or they may even intuitively go down certain roads etc cetera, etc cetera. and there may might be effective therapy but i think there's a good chance that they may go down the wrong road yeah because not every modality of therapy needs supervision as you know to practice i know we do as transactional analysis but there's a lot of nlp people out there and things like that where that's just not in their remit they don't need to have supervision well, I'm not sure I call that a therapy. No, but they, they you no, know, people go to them for yeah, therapy. It's interesting what you're saying, actually. So I didn't know what you just said. Um, I didn't know that NLP practitioners didn't have supervision. I also didn't know, uh, and I, and it's quite, I don't know, it's taken me aback, that um, there may be therapies where people don't have some sort of, uh, whatever word you want to call this, we'll call it supervisors and in this particular podcast for someone to share some of their lonely times with yeah they might have peer supervision ah you know what i mean but not right, necessarily okay that hierarchy of supervision. Oh, oh, cool. yeah yeah right, yeah now that makes more sense i can think of some therapies that have peer supervision yeah okay well that's that's a bit different uh it's an interesting one interesting about peer supervision 
um, can be very useful. Yeah. Um, but you're right, in TA, we have that more of a hierarchical structure that the people that we go to supervision with are people who, who, who've been, who have been more experienced than us and have spent a long more time, a lot of time, if you like, on the clinical road. Yeah. Um, so that the, the, it's much more of a, you could call it, it is hierarchical, but I like to think about in terms of hierarchicalness of experience. Definitely, yeah. And there's that ethical framework that works up with it as well. For me, I don't know how I feel about peer supervision because it's usually your equals and I don't know. I don't know whether I will feel comfortable sharing about my clients with peer supervision the same as what I would a supervisor in the clinical sense, if that makes sense. That makes sense. I've never had peer supervision. Uh, interesting. No, me neither. Uh, um, I've talked about the positives and the challenges uh, with regards to peer supervision. But I haven't had that experience myself. I've always been with supervisors who are, who are higher up in yeah. terms of experience, which I can where I can learn from. Yeah, yeah, because mm. that's growing as a therapist as well. Mm, mm, absolutely. I think the client. I, 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 let's go back to the client one moment. I, in my experience, clients feel much more protected if they know the therapist has a supervisor. Yeah. Now, of course, um, not all therapists will share that, I, but I think it's an assumption by most clients that their therapists have access to supervisors even if they don't use it. Yes, yeah. I might be wrong on that. I've never really gone out of my way to check, but in my experience, clients have often said, things like well do you have a supervisor is there somebody you can take things to and I think clients feel perhaps a little bit more secure if they know that the therapist also is human like everybody else and has somewhere to take yeah. um, professional issues too yeah because it is important you mm. know and, and some clients resonate with us some clients leave us with you know unfinished things that, that we've got to deal with as well so you know as well as having personal therapy to be able to take that to your supervisor yeah and also throughout all my years or decades of being a professional therapist a it's always been very very valuable for me and i believe it has been for clients and i believe it has, does aid uh, my my therapy in terms of it being more effective um but it, it was very important for me as I came to the end of my career and, you know, uh, needed to inform clients that I was retiring and pass them on to the particular people that yeah. I thought was really important. And I found it very hard that how to yeah. say goodbye and termination and all these different things that supervision at the end of my career was as important at the beginning of my career yeah I can imagine yeah because like you say you've been doing it for 40 years it's it's a grieving process for you to a certain extent not to be still practicing oh, tremendous clients yeah tremendous so I'm such an advocate of supervision I wanted to have this podcast to talk about how supervision is so effective sorry can aid therapy in a, such an effective way and without it the therapist i think i believe uh misses misses a very important professional support yeah themselves and of course for their um their client yeah 100 percent agree so thank you for allowing me to talk about that's absolutely that, fine that, that in this podcast yeah. So anybody that's out there that, is, you know, isn't seeing a supervisor, then look somebody up. Absolutely. I think it's so important. And once again, I think clients feel far more reassured if yeah. they know that their own therapist is human and has access to a supervisor if need be. Yeah. Totally. So mm -hmm. in the next podcast, we're going to be looking at uh, the retrieval of memories in the therapy process. 
Oh, yes. Such a wonderful conversation. I'm so looking forward to that. If I can remember, of course. Well, exactly. My memory is not what it used to be, Bobby. So we'll, we'll muggle through together in the next episode. Okay, great. <laughs> Speak to you soon. Speak to you soon. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.